Um, my hair is everywhere today, but that's all right. I don't care. I didn't feel like wearing a hat. So good morning. Welcome to the show. And I come as I am, the way I am, and the way I look. I don't fancy dancy up for this camera. I'm going to bring you truth, so you're not looking at me. Look at the truth. Don't look at me. Are you looking at me? Good morning. I think I already said good morning, but I'll say it again. Good morning. Welcome to the show. All right. I'm going to continue on here from yesterday. I did the brotherhood of God, or the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. So now I'm going to give you another doctrine of demons. And this is where all this crap comes out of Christendom. This one's continuous existence. Now think about this, continuous existence. All right. This is taught. Why is this taught? Because it refutes the resurrection from the dead. So the third article is quote-unquote, continuous existence. We are assured that this is far from a new revelation that was taught in the scriptures long ago. We are told, Paul said, whether absent or present, I do always those things that are pleasing in his sight. No matter what. And again, the words in Revelation, let him that is holy be holy still, and let him be that is filthy be filthy still. Our words that tell us when the end comes here in the context, whether by death or the coming of the Lord, the life we have settled to is the life in which we shall continue. Right. So, in plain words, they're not teaching a resurrection. They're refuting and saying there is no resurrection with continuous existent teaching which is a teaching of demons. What need there is there for what need is there for it? Ugh. If the Lord comes, we will not die, hence cannot be raised. If we die, we will we will need neither the resurrection nor the Lord's coming. For we have continuous existence, quote unquote. And not only is this taught in the Bible, but if is it is confirmed by the demons. Okay. So they're using an improper translation to teach this. They're not getting the truth at all. Of course, the phrase continuous existence really is intended to convey the idea of uninterrupted consciousness. Now, while a few ambiguous passages may be wrenched from their context to support such a thought, the scriptures certainly do not come out clearly on continuous existence like the demons. The demons deny the resurrection and they have so deluded Christendom that it is most unorthodox to cling to this fundamental of the faith. You cannot hold continuous existence and believe in the resurrection unless you degrade it to an unnecessary excrescence on the body of divine truth. Those who are alive cannot be raised from the dead. And how can there be a resurrection of the living? We are much in indebted to the demons for endorsing this doctrine of the church. <laughs> For their declaration ought to be more than ample to brand it as unscriptural and to warn us of its seductive nature. So in that sense, yeah, the contrast is clear. This was given to the demons, literally, to throw a backdrop of black and dark, dark background, to give confusion among those who are hardened in their heart and do not believe the truth of the resurrection of the dead. In the sense, they do not believe that Christ died and was dead for three days. So thus, the teaching is there was no resurrection. You continuously live in consciousness even when you die. Where does eternal torment come from? That's exactly what it is. Right? So, they're teaching that when you die, you either go to heaven or hell. So... Hell is eternal torment, and heaven is eternal bliss. This is a teaching of demons. We must, we must not expect it to seem unsound. It must appear right. Let us remember that we have to do, we have nothing to do with the seducing spirits, not flagrant, flagrant offenders against religion or morals or decency. 
So those seducing spirits, they love it because they'll teach morals and decency and then behind the scenes they will commit every kind of indecency and immorality. It's crazy. This is what comes out of that putrid church and the whole of it. You know, I, I gave the de de definition of religion. That's what it was. Deus and demonia. Demon teach, dread teach, fear teaching. It's all the same. The communion of, of spirits. We are sure that the first three articles of spiritualism contain nothing new but the fourth. The communion of spirits is contrary to the word of God. Yet there is one case in the scriptures of the return of a spirit to this world. The only case of the return of a disembodied spirit is that of Samuel. Okay, that was the witch of Endor. Samuel, there he is. No, he's not. That's a wicked spirit. So, yeah, it comes out in the scriptures too. Now, if we examine this closely we will find that the difference between the orthodox view of spiritism is merely a matter of quantity, not, not of truth. The demons do not affirm that all do communicate with the dead, but, they, but that they can. Okay, you can communicate with the dead. Well, you can't. They're dead. Now, since we are told there is one example in the Bible where this was actually done, the Bible also teaches that the communion of spirits is possible. Right. As we hope to have a special article on the Witch of Endor, we will not dismiss it at length here, except the, to point out that if Samuel was dead, and while dead was in communication with Saul, then this doctrine of the demons is true. In that case, however, it seems a pity that they have only a single instance to appeal to, to in all of the range of Holy Writ. Moreover, all those passages which speak of the dead as asleep and even perished, should there be no resurrection, must be revised to conform to this declaration of the demons. Personal Responsibility The fifth article of the Spiritist faith ought to, be, ought to lead no one astray who has ever known Christ as his Savior. Notwithstanding this, the strong instance, instance on repentance and works and character and the pre prevalence of the probationary idea has gradually shifted the burden of salvation from the sin-bearer to the shoulders of the sinner. Responsibility, quote-unquote, is a favorite word in theology and religion but finds no place in the scriptures. It is interesting to trace back all things to the only one who is really responsible, God himself. But the demons and men whom they have duped relieve him of all responsibility in his universe and place it on his creatures. It's your responsibility now to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you don't do that, you're screwed. But that's the putrid, sick teaching that I'm giving you. This is coming out from the, from the thraldoms of Christendom. This freaking doctrines of demons. Personal responsibility robs us of all the results of Christ's redemption. Repudiates righteousness and reconciliation and eclipses grace. Like the self-righteousness of the main scission. It is hardly fit to be cast to the dogs. We stand in Christ, have, having nothing of our own to mar the effulgence of his favor. There's nothing in us that can change that. So what the heck? If we're all about self-righteousness and we got this and we got that and we have the, this, this measure and that measure, blah. To me, that's God giving the measure out. It is his responsibility. It is his work in us through Christ, our head. Compensation and retribution hereafter. Okay, this is a good one. Concerning this and the succeeding article of faith, we are told there are not new. Both things are taught in the scriptures. It is, is it 
not staggering to read a sermon against spiritism calmly commending five out of seven articles which compose its creed, where the scriptural support for compensation and retribution is found in the scriptures is difficult to surmise unless, as usual, we are pointed to the speech of Abraham to the rich man. Right, the rich man that went was in hell. Yes, the rich man and Lazarus. There you go. There, indeed, we have some such doctrine as is here proposed by the demons. In the 16th of Luke, we have the spiritist doctrine of compensation and retribution succinctly, succinctly stated. Lazarus had received his evil things on earth, and in Hades he got good things to compensate. The rich man had received his good things on earth and suffered in flames to level his account. According to that, the poor, the miserable, the diseased, the filthy are the only ones who dare to look for ease in the future. And that not by grace through Christ, but merely as a matter of compensation. The rich, on the other hand, have no hope even in Christ, except at the pitiless hand of rep retribution. Does it not look as if the Pharisees, who te whose teaching the Lord is presenting in this parable, whose teaching the Lord is presenting in this parable? Yes, the Pharisees had imbibed this article of the doctrine of demons in their day. But how anyone who has known God's grace in Christ can insist that such a doctrine is taught in the scriptures passes all comp comprehension. Poorly translated scriptures, and they don't look at the context. A real student of the scriptures will look at the context and see who it's speaking about and seeing what the context is speaking, whether literal or figurative. Figure it out in the context. What is it, literal or figura, figurative? Always, of course, go with the literal, but there's figurative language in the scriptures. So if you look at the context and you study it out properly, you're going to get a real deal truth from God himself. Gracing you to see it, opening your eyes, giving you an unveiling or a revelation of the truth. Suppose we who believe receive only what in do in is our due, is our due. What would we get? Nothing. And what will what will we get? All things. The whole point is we're going to get all things in Christ. So never mind of what our due is and our reward is. You know, I've heard this so many times about the days of Christ even. That we're there to go get a reward. And it's something that we did and we're getting a reward. You know what the reward is? The reward is to God's glory. What we give out. And what God is going to show us. What came through us. What he brought through us. This is the reward. And it's all to the glory of God. You want to know of, of a real requital at the dais. That's exactly what it's going to be. We're going to be overjoyed at what God brought through us. Right now, we have very limited view, very limited view. I like what Seth does. He goes this, limited view, limited view. It's only a little tiny glimmer. We'll get some fruit. Yes, fruit of the Spirit. But we don't get the full measure until we have our new bodies at the days of Christ. And then we're going to see where the word went out. The word of God through us. And this is going to be to the glory of God to see this. To be awesome display of God's power in our weakness. Because we are weak beings. And God's power operates through weak beings to give it out. Retribution is a word which is never used in a general way in the word. Capital W in the word. The closer we scan God's judgments, the more we are impressed with their salutary, salutary nature. They are always the per precursor of blessing. The dull and dreadful idea of retribution without any fruit, but the bitter memories and remorse is foreign to all God's ways. So that we are sure that for the saints there is in in. Infinitely, there is infinitely 
more than compensation, and for the sinner, he aims at a result far beyond the meaning of mere retribution. So it's a matter of punishment. Okay, we look at a punishment. Okay, eternal punishment taught in, this, in, in uh, Christendom. Eternal punishment. Eternal salvation. Eternal punishment. What kind of phrases are those? Those are taken from an improper translation for sure. So you're going to get a real deal when you go to the proper scriptures and see it from a continual concordant giving. So it's through a concordant rendering that you're going to understand a little bit better. Stay with me. Path of endless progression. That's another one. This is the final article in the creed, and we are assured that it is in perfect harmony with the Bible. No passages are given to support this view. Endless progression sounds much better than ceaseless imperfection, yet the latter is involved in the former, for there can be no progress in perfection. When a man is mature, he ceases to grow. If this is a parable of the growth of the race, we can understand something of the goal put before us in the scriptures. Man peers into the past and dreams of ceaseless progress until the present. He tries to pierce the future and sees nothing but a treadmill where there is progress, quote unquote, but as it is endless, it never reaches its goal. He has no commencement and no completion. God has a definite beginning and predestined consummation. He has an object. He works according to a purpose. There is progress indeed, but it is not endless. He does not shoot into the air. His arrow reaches its mark. He does not run aimlessly. He reaches his goal and mark that in human history, there is a twofold movement, an ebb and a flow. When man is active, there is regress, not progress. The path of endless progression of the demons is trod only by human strength. Their faces are all set to the rear. Their feet falter and stumble and fall. They should name it the road of endless retrogression. It is only when God actively intervenes that there is true progress. He not only recovers man from his backsliding, but draws him on, on towards the goal which he has in view. And I would look at that word uh, in quotes, backsliding. That word is used in Christendom. Oh, you backslid today? Well, now you're going to have to do a lot more Hail Marys, or you're going to have to do a lot more service in the Lord to catch up now that you backslid. The progress of man and the goal of God are as diverse as, as two things can be. Man aims at being a little God, a little God, small g, on his own account, irrespective of others. He wants to get. His object is to be self-sufficient. God wants to give. He is concerned about all his creatures. His goal is to be their all. In conclusion, let us press this most important fact. The doctrine taught by the demons is orthodox to an alarming extent. In other words, the seducing spirits are not confined to so-called spiritualism. They have invaded the church and have succeeded in eclipsing the scriptures. They substitute their own doctrines for the truth. Most of the manifestations parading as gifts of the Spirit of God are really due to the obsession of demons. Many of the doctrines set forth in prophetic conferences as the unadulterated truth are per permeated with the teachings of demons. The people of God of all denominations are exhorted to stand by these great truths, so rejected in our days, and to contend earnestly for fun fundamental truths, some of which are the very doctrines of demons, against which they desire to shield the saints. Right.
They can't delude us. Those who are founded in Christ cannot be deluded by these wicked forces, cannot be deluded by the doctrines of demons, because we have a solid foundation in Christ. We are not being blown hither and thither with every wind of teaching. Like Martin said this morning on his video, we are not being blown everywhere. We are solid in the foundation of Christ, and that's it. And this is what comes out of us in our videos, the ones who are really giving out truth, really teaching truth from the scriptures. Those are the ones that are giving out real truth, not the false, fictitious, phony baloney teaching of demons, which pervert and deceive and confuse. It comes out one big hodgepodge of mixed up crap. You have to understand, there is only two evangels. Two, that's it. It was Paul's evangel that was given to the nations and Peter to the circumcision. And then you're going to get correctly cut the word of truth. And then you're going to get true foundational truth. I love you all. Have a wonderful Wednesday.